Woo! Wow. This is just fantastic. It is wonderful to be here with you all on such a celebration Sunday. It is fantastic to be here on this special baptism time. And today, uh, the talk that I'm going to share with you, I've entitled it, More Than Meets the Eye. More Than Meets the Eye. So today we know we're here for baptisms, and very practically, physically, what will happen is the five people who are going to be baptized will go into the water, go down into the water, and then we'll come back up again, and then we'll all celebrate together. So that's what's physically happening. But actually, there's more to this than meets the eye. There's more to this. There's, we're going to be looking deeper and higher and wider with not just physical eyes, but also with spiritual eyes to see what's actually happening and what does this mean for those who are being baptized, but also for all of us who are here today. And actually, as Christians, we're people who are always looking with physical eyes at what's literally happening in front of us, and we've got spiritual eyes open saying, what else is going on? There's more here than meets the eye. Let's be looking beyond. So, I'm Ruth, as has already been said, and I'm one of the members here at the church, uh, married to Mark, and yeah, we just welcome you so heartily here today, especially if you're visiting. And if you have any questions or comments or wonderings about everything that's going on today, we would love to talk to you about that. Please do feel free to come and speak to us or come to our welcome area at the end of the service. It is fantastic to have you here, whether you're visiting, whether you're a guest of one of those being baptized, uh, you've just popped in, and whatever your belief is, it's really great to have you here. If we can help in any way, do speak to us. And so we're going to be opening up, as I say, what's really happening, what's happening beyond the surface today. Now, I wonder if you could design the God you wanted to believe in, what kind of a God would you design? <laughs> what would that God be like? It's a bit of a a kind of strange and maybe silly question, but I wonder if you've ever thought about it. What characteristics, what attributes, what qualities would you want to see in God? Now, of course, as Christians, we believe in God. I think everybody is aware that's part of our faith system. But actually, believing in God is kind of only half the story, really. Um, the kind of bigger part of it is what kind of a God do we believe in? Because it's actually sort of possible to believe, I guess, in a God that you don't really like, that you might be afraid of, or a God that you don't want anywhere near you. So what kind of a God do we actually believe in? And what's he like? And do we want to know him or not? And actually, the folks being baptized today are actually not so much saying they want to adhere to a set of beliefs or take on some moral standards or get a new religious title for their life. What they're actually saying is they've discovered a God who is alive and real. And more to that, they found a God who they think is worth following and worth building their lives on. A God who is, as the Bible says, good and kind and compassionate and loving and who stands up against injustice, has authority over evil, who loves the poor, who cares for and lifts up the brokenhearted and who one day, the Bible says, will come and wipe away every tear from our eyes. The Bible actually says that about God. Isn't that amazing? That's the kind of God that is worth following, worth changing our life for. More than that, though, not just a God that's real, who's worth following, but actually a God who talks to us 
and walks with us and wants to be close to us and to give us life in all its fullness. Life in all its fullness. Actually, in my day job, I am a leadership coach and I work with different leaders who work uh, with organizations all around the world in different countries. And as I walk alongside with them, it's amazing to see a common theme emerge. Actually, one of the questions most of these leaders that I work with are asking is, how can I have a life which is satisfying, which is purposeful, and which has a lasting impact for good? That's what I really want. Satisfying, purposeful, and that has an impact that goes further than just me for good. And actually, that's something that God cares about for us as well. Because God wants us to have a life and to build one that is satisfying, purposeful, and has a lasting impact. So how? How does God say that we do this? What are we actually talking about happening here today? Well, there's actually a very simple story that we're going to look at together. And this is the point I've, I've just made here about our life with God not being a religion, but a relationship with this living God. So let's have a look at what we want to look at in the Bible, this story that Jesus told about building our life God's way, so it would be satisfying and purposeful. So here's the story. It's from the Bible, from the book of Luke, chapter 6, if you want to open a Bible. Otherwise, it's right there on the screen. How do we build in this way? Let's see what Jesus said. Jesus said, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and lay the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them, these words, is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Okay, comforting words and challenging words in the Bible. In a way, Jesus kind of makes it pretty simple. And he says, if you want this satisfying, purposeful life that lasts through the storms and streams and floods of life, actually, hear my words and do them. Do what I say and your life will be built on a rock. That's the basis of what Jesus says. That's how he says we go about it. But this being a talk... I will expand slightly on that one point. And we're going to have a little look together at what does it mean to build God's way? What is it that the guys being baptized are actually saying they're stepping into in their lives today? Well, building God's way, which is basically what the Christian life is all about, it affects where we build, how we build, and who we build with. So as those who are building God's way and choosing to follow his way of life, we actually build our lives on his word, on the word of Jesus written down in the Bible. That is our foundation of everything that we're building and the way that we choose to live. How do we build? Very simply, we take the life of Jesus and it's like, you know when you're building a house and you're thinking, how can I build this thing to be straight and solid and going upright and not skewy? Actually, we take the life of Jesus and that's like our measuring stick and our guide to say, hey, this is what an upright life looks like. So if I want to build in that way in my life, this is like the template and model of how I want to live. That's his life. And then, who are we building with? Well, actually, we've already got friends and family, but when we choose to build God's way, we find we've got a whole load of other friends and family that we get to build with as well. 
We get to build with the church, God's people who are also choosing to build in his way. Not only that, but also with God himself. With the Holy Spirit of God, God's unseen presence speaking to us, communicating with us, who walks alongside us to comfort us, to challenge us, to lead us forward and show us how to live our lives. God really talks to us. That's what prayer is all about. Talking to God and listening to what he says and then living our life off the basis of it. I suppose in a way, we're all building our lives on something. We've all got some beliefs and values that we're, we're building on. We've all got things that influence us, people that we're measuring our lives against and an idea of what success looks like, right? So it's just the question of where are you building? What are you building on? Who are you measuring your success by? And who are you building with? What does it look like? It's, it's kind of funny. I guess as I was preparing, I was thinking about a couple of times when somebody's discovered that I'm a Christian and they've said, oh, you know, as Christians, you think you've got it all together. You think you've got it sorted. You think you're so perfect. You think you've, you know, you're really all that. Um, and I have to laugh because actually, well, at least for me anyway, being a Christian basically means I tried building my life my own way. It went totally wrong. And I've been amazed to discover God who actually wants to help me build his way, which is way better than mine. I'm building his way and it's an absolute delight and privilege to me. So... One extra thing that I'd like to add to how we're building, and this is a reminder for us, is that we're not just built into a new family of faith now, like these guys who are being baptized, they're actually becoming part of the Open Door Church community and entering into walking alongside all of us, but we also get to join with a whole line of faith family that has been walking with God through centuries that we get to read about in the Bible. There's actually years and years and ancestors and ancestors of people who have chosen to live their life this way, and it's like we get to enter into their family story. And just like baptism is a sort of simple act, but with a deep and profound meaning that there's, there's more to it than meets the eye, there was actually another practice that our faith ancestors did many years ago, which was kind of similar. And that was called the Feast of Tabernacles. Hopefully it will make sense why I'm sharing this with you in a moment. So the Feast of Tabernacles that our faith ancestors did many years ago was basically a festival of tents. It was kind of like a camping festival, really. So every year for eight days, uh, all of the people would gather up all of their things, leave their settled houses and their homes and where they lived, and they'd take all of their things to Jerusalem, and they'd build these huts, basically, out of wood and structures, and they'd live in these for eight days. Eight days living in this kind of temporary structure. So I guess it was kind of like, to the physical eye, it looks like a camping festival. But what was going on spiritually? What was there that was more than meets the eye about this one? Well, actually, the people had got settled, they'd built homes, they'd kind of got into a usual routine of life, but every year, they would unsettle themselves and live a temporary life for eight weeks. And they were basically, eight days, sorry, yes. And they were basically saying, hey, let's not be fooled. Let's not only look with physical eyes at what's going on here. Let's remember that even though our settled lives and our houses and our jobs and our possessions look really secure and really rocky, actually, they could all go in an instant. Our true rock is actually God himself, the one who we build our lives on. He is our rock. So that was part of it. Another thing was, before they all got settled in their settled lives, God's people 
actually lived a kind of nomadic life. They used to travel around to many different places. They had to go on a big journey where God was leading them every step of the way. Some of you will remember this story. And then they got settled. And so this camping festival was a way to remind them as a whole community, hey, we might be settled, but actually, if God tells us to move on again, we want to move with God. Actually, we are anchored more to God and his presence than we are to our settled lives. We are people who move with him for his purposes. And finally, it had another meaning. They were also wanting to say, there's more to our lives here on earth than meets the eye. They were saying that actually one day when we die, we're going to go somewhere else to live for eternity that's going to make this life look like a tent. This life's going to be like a tent. It's going to be like sand compared to, even though this life is a great gift, let's enjoy it, but there's going to be even more that's coming. And we don't want to forget and live our lives focused just here when actually there's more to this than meets the eye. There's something else coming, let's not forget. It's a real, really simple thing to do, but it had a really deep spiritual significance. And actually, funnily enough, there are many people, especially from the Jewish community around the world, that still do this ceremony every year for eight days. In fact, it starts tomorrow. <laughs> so we're right at the right time of year to remember it. So how, does, how on earth does that link to what we're talking about today and what's going on? Well, we've said about where we're building, how we're building, and who we're building with. This is all about what we're building for what the bigger purpose of our whole life is about. Actually, it's about walking with God now, but also into eternity. We were just singing, when we've been there 10,000 years, there's more to come. And these guys here today being baptized are saying actually that they want to be building God's way, but also with God's perspective on the whole of life. They're entering in to this faith tradition, but with a bigger view to what is also coming. So I'm nearly finished. We're nearly gonna move on to the bit that we're really all excited about and really looking forward to, getting to hear some of these stories and also watch the amazing baptisms. But just finally, I would like us to revisit the story of the two builders because I think there's a little bit more to this story than meets the eye. I just want to ask you, if you will, to imagine that you are the person who has been building that house on the sand. I want to imagine that you've built the house and you've put it together and then you hear the thunder rolling and the stream breaking and the water starting to come and you're like, ah, the water's starting to drip through the roof, actually. And there's some water coming under the door. And I realize with a sinking heart, do you know what? This is not going to stand. There's actually going to be some consequences to the way I've built this. It's not going to stand the test of time. I wonder how that would feel or what it would be like. And then you kind of look out of the window, and there on the rock, is that person who's built their house on the rock and their house is sturdy and it's strong and it's got this lovely warmth inside it, the fire is glowing, there's food on the table and it's secure and it's safe and it, oh my goodness, it just looks so strong and safe and appealing. And then you hear a knock at your door. You hear a knock at your door and you open the door and there at the door is the person who built the house on the rock. And you think, oh great, you know, they've come to gloat. They've come to tell me how appalling my house looks like. Why are they here? But actually, to your surprise, the person at the door looks at you with great love in their eyes. 
they look at you kindly. And even more surprisingly, they hold out a key to you. And they say, I've seen the storm coming for a long time. And I've seen you building your house. And I don't think your house is going to hold up. So I've built my house for you. If you will accept it, I want to give you the key to my house so you can go and be safe on that rock. I wonder what that would be like. You see, actually, Jesus told the story of these two builders, but actually the Bible says that Jesus himself was the only person who was 100% able to build his house on the rock. The Bible says that Jesus came to show us the way to build, the way to live a life, but there's more to it than that. He actually came to offer us the key to his life. He came to build his house and to live a life that was perfect and rocky, so when God comes to look at and evaluate our lives and our motives and our thinking and our way of building, that actually, unfortunately, would fall flat under that kind of inspection and investigation. He's come to offer us a way to be safe, not in our building, but in his building, what he has built, what he has made. And I guess we all know really that there are consequences of when we build in a way that isn't in line with how God wants us to. That actually we get hurt when we don't build properly. We hurt other people when we don't build properly. And when others don't walk in a good way, it hurts them and it hurts us as well. Actually, it works both ways. And I guess there are consequences of building badly. And there need to be consequences of justice. Someone has to pay. And the Bible says that it's like taking the key from the man who's got the strong house, that Jesus offers us his key to his strong house, to the life that he's built, but he also takes our key to our house. And that even though he was the best builder there was, he took the consequences of the way we built our lives and died on a cross to take what we deserved. That's actually what we kind of have been talking about and thinking about, even as we've been singing. That he has come with amazing grace to offer us something that we didn't build, we didn't deserve, but actually where we can find safety. And what was an incredible sacrifice became an incredible miracle. Because Jesus died for us on the cross, took the consequences of the life that we built, but then three days later, he rose again from the tomb and came to life by the power of God. And that's actually why we celebrate. That's why we were singing all these songs about how amazing God is earlier. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. He has given us a way to be safe on the rock, despite everything that we haven't been able to do. But more than that, he's come to life again to walk this journey with us as we build in partnership with him. He's alive and walking alongside us. So, it's interesting, these guys who are going to be baptized today, they'll look the same at the beginning than they will at the end physically, but there's a whole load more going on than what meets the eye. Spiritually speaking, they're choosing to build God's way in their lives. They're saying actually that they want to follow him where he leads them wherever that might be, that he's going to be their rocky place. And they're saying they're accepting that key that Jesus has offered them. And they're choosing to sit in his house and in his dwelling that he has done, rather than in what they've built themselves. It's an amazing, amazing moment 
For some, it's a huge shift that's just happened quite recently. For others, it's been a long process over time. So there's also an invitation for you here today. If you haven't yet discovered this God who speaks to us and who shows us a whole new way to live our lives and build, we would love to pray with you or talk with you if you want to find out more. We'd love to share our stories. But also for those who have already decided to be baptized, who Gina was referring to, it's a reminder for us as well. Hey, what new level of building work is God inviting us into in our lives today? And where can our spiritual eyes be more open to what's really going on that God wants to reveal to us in a new way today? Physical eyes and spiritual eyes. There's more than this than meets the eye.